the seventh chapter of Daniel. We just covered in verse number seven of Daniel chapter seven that this verse brings to view the Roman Empire. Amen. And verse number eight shows us the little horn. And we have discovered that this little horn is popery. This little horn is the papacy. And the Bible tells us in verse number 19 and verse 20 of Daniel chapter 7 that this little horn grew to become a stout horn. And he was more stout than his fellows. Meaning that this little horn was far greater. He carried a greater influence than all the leaders of the then Roman Empire. And the Bible tells us now that the word stout means the chief leader. And Popery, in this time, grew to become a stout figure, grew to become the world's superpower. Stout, the chief leader. Stout, the master. Stout, the chief captain. And now we shall discover again what brought about the papacy, Popery, to grow from being a little horn to becoming a stout horn, the chief leader. We are told in history that Emperor Justinian of the Roman Empire gave the Pope of Rome world dominion. Listen to what this says here, friends. It says, we're quoting from Daniel and the Revelation. It says, the Heruli, the Goths and Vandals who conquered Rome embraced the Arian faith and became enemies of the Catholic Church. It was especially for the purpose of exterminating this heresy that Emperor Justinian decreed the Pope to be the head of the church and the corrector of heretics. Go back with me now to Daniel chapter 7. So this little horn, the papacy, the Bible says that she grew to become a stout horn, the world's superpower, the world's chief master and chief leader. And the Bible tells us once the papacy grew to become stout, that she began to persecute God's people to change times and laws. Look with me at verse number 24. Verse 24 mentions again this stout horn and verse number five says and remember the word horn typifies king typifies a kingdom that's verse 23 and verse 24 of daniel chapter 7. look with me now at verse 25. this stout horn it says and he shall speak great words against the most high and shall wear out the saints of the most high and shall think to change god's times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time now we have covered this before so once the stout horn the papacy came into being the bible says in verse 25 the papacy began to speak great words against god wear out god's saints which means to persecute god then it says to change God's times and laws and that this will continue for a time, times and the dividing of time. Now we have covered this and we have seen this phrase, time, times and the dividing of time represents a time period of 1,260 prophetic days, a thousand 260 literal years. Hold your place in the seventh chapter of Daniel. Let's go in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 12. The Bible tells us in the 12th chapter of Revelation and verse number 6, the Bible says, And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. 1260 prophetic days and a days represent a year a day points to a year in bible prophecy verse number 14 says and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she's nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent now we have discovered the time period time 
times and half a time means 1260 literal years and the papacy received her deadly wound in the year 1798 she began ruling in the year ad 538 through 1798 and what happened to the papacy in 1798 history says that the papacy the pope was dethroned in the year 1798 by a French army. So think about this, friends. That means in 1798, Popery, papacy, was no longer a stout horn. If that's clear, say amen. Because stout, the stout horn means a world ruler, the chief leader, the chief master, the chief captain. Since the papacy received its deadly wound in 1798, the Pope was dethroned. She lost her temporal sovereignty and power. Then it means that the little horn, Popery, was no longer the stout horn in 1798. If that is clear, my friends, say amen. This is 1798. But the Bible tells us that the papacy will rule the world again. The Bible tells us, as Popery persecuted God's people from A.D. 538 through 1798, that Popery is going to re-emerge and persecute God's saints until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Let's confirm that. Daniel chapter 7, verse number 20, the Bible says, and of the ten horns, that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn, that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints, and prevailed against them until who came? until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the most high and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom so the bible tells us that the that the that, that the papacy popery will again re-emerge to rule the world and persecute God's saints until the time will come for God's people to enter the kingdom made new. Is that clear, my friends? So this tells us persecution is coming again. But notice again, in 1798, the papacy received its deadly wound. The papacy in 1798 was no longer the stout horn, the chief leader, the chief captain the chief master but something happened after 1798 which fulfilled prophecy showing that the papacy is now that little horn again now notice what does little horn mean little horn means a little kingdom go with me the seventh chapter of daniel verse number eight says the little horn and verse number 24 it says, and the ten horns out of this kingdom are what, friends? Are ten kings. Kings reign over what? Kingdoms. So this is a little kingdom. So now, after 1798, when the papacy was dethroned, no longer a stout horn, when did the papacy become officially again that little horn, that little kingdom? kingdom when it was in 1929 when Mussolini when Italy gave to the Vatican that small piece of land over there in Vatican City gave the papacy that small piece of land in Vatican City now which is the smallest kingdom the smallest state today it is the Vatican State Popery the papacy when the Bible says a little horn, a little kingdom, how little is little? It must be the smallest. Listen here, friends. This is uh, the History Channel headline. It says, what is the smallest 
country in the world. Skip on down, it says, there is a country in the world smaller than New York City's Central Park and one with a population smaller than a typical high school class. Based on landmass, Vatican City is the smallest country in the world, situated on the western bank of the Tiber River. Vatican City's two-mile border is landlocked by Italy, the official seat of the independent state until the Lateran Treaty of when, friends? Of 1929. So after 1798, when the papacy was dethroned, no longer a stout horn, a world ruler, a chief leader. In 1929, Pope again officially, based on prophecy, became that little horn, that little kingdom, if that's clear, say amen. Not only in the History Channel, look at what the BBC said recently headline this is june 16th 2015 vatican country profile it says uh, the vatican is the smallest independent state in the world it says and uh, residents of the spiritual leadership of where friends of the roman catholic church so now notice go back with me now to daniel chapter 7. so since 1929 when Pope officially again became that little horn, the smallest kingdom from 1929 to the present. What has been happening to Pope the little horn? The little horn is now growing to become a stout horn. Again, what does the word stout mean? The word stout means a chief leader, a chief ruler. Go back to verse number 20. Of Daniel chapter 7, the last phrase of verse 20 says, speaking about the stout horn, it says, A mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows, than all the other kings, than all the other horns, than all the other world leaders. And today, my friends, based on the crises that are affecting the world today, who do the majority of presidents, princes, chancellors, prime ministers, who do they all look to for instructions, directions, and solutions to solve the problems that are plaguing the global societies? It is none other than Pope of Rome, even today, Pope Francis. In other words, the little horn is now growing to become the stout horn. And I will even say the little horn is now today the stout horn. When the majority were talking about the effects of climate change, who did they all, who do they all look to for instructions and policies to solve climate change? None other than the Pope of Rome. What about wars and terrorism? Who do they all look to for instructions and solutions to combat so-called terrorist terrorism and to bring peace among nations? The Pope of Rome, he's more stout than his fellows. The, the issue between America and Cuba, the U.S. and Cuba, who came in and brought about a so-called diplomatic tie between Cuba and the U.S., the Pope of Rome, he's more stout than his fellows. When we consider the global economy, who do they all look to to help to solve the financial crises? The Pope of Rome, you get the point. And so it is with health care. So it is with moral issues. The Pope of Rome, the little horn, oh friends, has now become... The stout horn, go back with me to Daniel chapter 7. When the little horn became the stout horn between 538 and 1798, what did the stout horn do based on verse 25 of Daniel 7? The Bible says, he shall speak great words against the Most High and wear out the saints of the Most High. 
and thing to change God's times and laws. So what is coming upon God's people since today, Popery wants that little horn will now become a stout horn. What is coming upon God's people? He shall again wear out the saints of the Most High. Persecution, friends, and think to change times, God's times and laws, which point to, in the primary sense, a Sunday law crisis. He shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Is persecution coming again? Well, verse 20 through verse 22 of Daniel 7 says, He shall make war with God's saints until the ancient of days came. And judgment is given to God's saints and the time for God's people to possess the kingdom. Is persecution coming again? I want to share with you something here. Presently, Pope, Ray, Pope Francis and his agents are now instilling and driving fear indirectly and somewhat directly into the hearts of God's saints, compelling them and forcing them not to proclaim the everlasting gospel of Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 through verse 12. Because those who present this everlasting gospel, the present truth of those three angels' messages, identifying who Babylon is, identifying who mystery Babylon the great is, who is a popery, the mother of harlots. This is now being called a hate speech. And those who use hate speech are now being labeled as, talk to me, they are now being labeled as terrorists. And what are they now saying must happen to terrorists? They must be persecuted. Those who preach the third angel's message, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark, the same shall receive the wrath of God. That means to preach that message, we must first identify who the beast is. And the beast is the little horn. The beast is the stout horn, namely the papacy. Who is the image of the beast? Apostate Protestantism. Specifically also, apostate Protestant America. But to say this, they're now saying that is hate speech. You are a terrorist. So now, God's people, most of them are trembling. They are silencing the message because they are afraid to be called bigots. They are afraid to be called haters and traitors and even terrorists. To preach that message, we must identify what the mark of the beast is, which is enforced Sunday observance with persecution for those who refuse to bow and pray. And her agents are now telling people, we must be aware of these individuals who are preaching hate, preaching division among the churches, division among religions, division among the nations. They are terrorists. Listen here, friends. You must see this. Do you remember recently what the Pope said, Pope Francis, on BBC? He says, headline, after the Paris attacks, Pope Francis says, freedom of speech has limits. Listen here, friends. Uh, it says uh, recently, this is just a few days ago, Catholic news agency, it says headline, jihadists arrested for threats against Pope Francis. What, my friends? It says jihadists are arrested because of threats against Pope Francis. Now, God's people... God's Bible belief in Christians don't take up swords to fight against individuals because the weapons of our warfare aren't carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Our weapon is the word of God. And the very same sentiments now being used against so-called terrorists will be used against God's people because they are preaching the everlasting gospel 
of Revelation 14, verse 6 to verse 12, the three angels' messages. So think now, friend. So if we preach against Pope based on prophecy, if we expose the man of sin based on prophecy, they are going to say, you are threatening the Pope. Oh, friends, can you see it? You are threatening the Pope's life. If we preach who Mr. Babylon is, and that Babylon, come on, let's quote that second angel's message. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. If we present that message and identify who the primary Babylon is, mystery Babylon the Great, and that Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Don't be surprised, Mark, God's word. Don't be surprised if they say you are threatening the life of the Pope. And you are also a terrorist. And you must receive the same treatment that terrorists receive, such as imprisonment without proper documentation and also legal steps even death can we see where we are listen here friends he said recently the stout horn said recently vatican insider this is just a few days ago in december 2015 headline reads pope francis calls on global leaders to abolish what friends to abolish the death penalty what to abolish the death penalty, calling on global leaders to abolish the death penalty. Now, this may sound as if the stout horn, the papacy has changed. But think now, friends, what happened to God's saints, to God's faithful people, God's Bible-believing Christians, God's commandment-keeping people, between A.D. 538 and 1798, when Pope ruled the world. Again, Daniel 7, verse 25 says that the papacy wore out the saints of God, persecuted God's people. Now think, how did Pope persecute God's people between 538 and 1798 when God's people were all around the world? It simply means then, and history confirms, that the Pope of Rome and successive popes between 538 and 1798 controlled and influenced the leaders of various nations to root out, to excommunicate, to persecute, to imprison God's saints who were occupying the various nations of the then known world. This happened, and now the Pope is saying, Oh, leaders, abolish the death penalty. That's a deception. And remember, he is a professed Jesuit. And Jesuits and Pope Francis has taken the Jesuit oath, which says they can tell lies. Why? Because the end justifies the means. Listen to me, my friends. So while it seems as if the focus is just on so-called terrorists, ISIS, Boko, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, etc., the Bible says, once the little horn became the stout horn, verse 25, the attack was placed upon God's saints. It is coming again. Has the papers changed? Global leaders put an end to the death penalty when the papacy maimed, butchered, and killed God's people, burned them at the stake for standing for God. And the Bible tells us the papacy will never change. So that statement is deceptive. Look with me. The Bible tells us in the 13th chapter of the Revelation, go there with me, verse number 1 and verse number 2. Well, from verse 1 through verse number 10, of the 13th chapter of the Revelation, we see a description of the papacy. Amen. And verse number two shows us the primary and significant identification of the papacy. Verse number two says, And the beast which I saw was like unto what animal? 
was likened unto a leopard. The whole body of the papacy is likened unto a leopard, the mouth of a lion, the feet of a bear. But the whole body is a leopard. Why does the Bible use a symbol of the leopard to depict the papacy? Because the papacy, like a leopard, will never change. The Bible says the leopard will the leopard cannot change its spots. I want to read that text for you. Write down Jeremiah chapter 13 and verse 23. Go there with me, Jeremiah chapter 13 and verse 23. Many times when we read this, we stop at the first phrase of that verse. Let's read the whole verse. Verse 23, Jeremiah 13. Listen what this says. Can the, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? No, is the answer. Listen now. Then may you also do good that are accustomed to do evil. So what symbol is used to depict the papacy? The leopard. And the next sentence says, the leopard cannot change its spots. Likewise, may you do good who are accustomed to do evil. The papacy by nature, popery by nature is evil. So all these words, oh, let's take care of the earth. Oh, let's take care of the of the poor says the pope oh let's take care of the global financial system oh 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 it's deception look with me chapter 13 of the revelation look with me chapter 13 verse number 15 the bible tells us in verse 15 that persecution is coming again and it is coming through the papacy and her agents verse 15 says and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, the image of the papacy, the beast. And he calls, it says, uh, the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So is the death penalty coming again for God's faithful people? The answer is yes. Verse 16, all he causes, both small and great, free and poor, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive that mark. Is persecution coming again for God's people? Father in heaven, please, dear God, please, Lord, arrest our attention this evening. Is our prayer stir us up? 2016 is a year for aggressive evangelism. Is our prayer in Christ's name? Friends, hear me very carefully. Just as we see that persecution is nearing, the majority of God's people today, like Elijah, are fleeing into a cave. The cave of fear. The cave of silencing the message of those three angels. We are running into caves before we stand firm and declare the everlasting gospel. Hear me carefully. We are told in the book, The Great Controversy, page 609 and 610, God's ambassadors should have nothing to do with consequences. They must present the truths of God and leave the results with him. In Acts chapter 5, when they... When they placed Peter and John in prison because Peter and John were proclaiming the present truth of that time, which ran contrary to the policies of the church of that day, the policies of the Roman state of that day, the Bible says when they beat uh, Peter and John and placed them in prison, the angel of the Lord descended and opened the prison house and say, Peter and John, go forth. And the Bible says, God told Peter and John, present the message again. Preach again the words of life. And when they said, did we not tell you, Peter and John, not to preach in this man's name, not to preach that present truth? 
Peter said, we ought to obey God rather than men. It's no time to be running in caves. First Kings chapter 19, go there with me. 2016 is a year for aggressive evangelism. First Kings chapter 19. Verse number 1 through verse 4 says, When Elijah heard that Jezebel had threatened his life, the Bible says he ran away into a cave. We can see now persecution is nearing, persecution is coming, and the majority of the administrators of this denomination are putting a muzzle over them. They are zipping it up and professed, present should preachers are afraid to present these messages probation's hour is fast closing persecution is coming but we have to present the message death before dishonor we cannot be silenced in a time of crisis listen now when elijah ran into that cave what did god say to elijah what question was asked elijah what doest thou here, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1, all the way through verse number 18. What doest thou here? And of course, Elijah began to say, I was fearful for my life, running from a church, Jezebel, who is modern day Jezebel, the mother of harlots, which church is committing unlawful relationship with the leaders of the various world as Jezebel committed fornication with Ahab. Modern day Jezebel is popery. The application is clear. Why are we hiding? And God said to Elijah, come out of the cave of fear. Come out of the cave and go forward. And God told Elijah, set forth three men, Ahaziel, Jehu and the last of the three was Elisha and what was the work of Elisha and Elijah to establish a training school in the time when persecution was nearing hear me now and verse number 18 God said to Elijah yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal and every mouth which hath not kissed him so in a time when we see that persecution is nearing what is God telling safe to serve what is God saying to me? It's time to establish training school for missionary workers so I can have and find the 7,000, even the 140 and 4,000, those who do not bow their knees to Baal, to false worship, nor kiss Baal, nor kiss the image of Baal. Praise God. Do you see, my friends? It is time. But when we hear this, some of us say, Pastor, I feel insufficient. I don't think I have the qualifications for missionary work. The last time we met, I shared with you a potent statement from Testimonies for the Church. Volume 6, page 444 says, Many of God's people, they may feel or may hear that they are inefficient to do missionary work for God, but if they can pray. And then a few more things were listed. God can use them to be aggressive soul winners for him. Listen here, friends. Testimonies for the church. Volume 6, page 444. Those whom God employs as his instruments may be regarded by some as inefficient listen as inefficient but if they can pray pause right there but if they can pray god can use them the last time we met i spent a great deal of time addressing how to pray not just what to pray but how to pray we cover this notice now the second principle given for those who are to be God's instruments to perform and conduct aggressive evangelism for him, it says, uh, if in simplicity they can speak the truth because they love it, 
God can and will use them. Listen here, friends. It says, those whom God employs as his instruments may be regarded by some as inefficient. But if they can pray, if in simplicity, underscore that, put that on your notepad, on your study book. It says, if in simplicity, they can talk the truth because they love it, they may reach the people through the Holy Spirit's power. Do you see it, friends? If in simplicity, we can speak the truth because we love it, we can reach souls through the power of the Holy Spirit. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. So what does this phrase mean? That's our aim this evening. In the next few moments. So after we have prayed, after we have prayed to God about the souls, after God brings, up, brings to our minds this person, that person, and we write their names down on our prayer book, and we pray, we agonize with God for these souls, fulfilling the words of Job 16, verse 21. I won't go back there right now. That was part one. Let me move on. After we have done that, it says now, if in simplicity we can speak God's truth because we love it, God will use us to be his soul winners. So what does that phrase mean? Listen here. It says, reading on, if in simplicity... They can talk the truth because they love it. They may reach the people through the Holy Spirit's power. Listen now. As they present the truth in simplicity, meaning in clarity, plainly, very clearly, as they present the truth in simplicity, reading from the word of God or recalling incidents of experience, the Holy Spirit makes an impression on mind and character. Pause right there. So what does it mean to speak the truth in simplicity? It means uh, as we sit with the people, we must read from God's word and also we must share our life experiences. How we have received the power from God to overcome. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. And then we shall read. When the souls hear the word of God presented that way, it says uh, it will bring the word to life. Praise God. It will arrest their attention. Praise God. And the truth which they formerly doubted, they will now believe. Praise God. Listen here. For, it says uh, the will becomes subordinate to the will of God. The truth, note this, the truth heretofore not understood comes to the heart with living conviction and becomes what, friends? And becomes a spiritual reality. Do you see it, friends? So now, after we have prayed for these souls, we have wept with God for these souls, then, God will providentially allow us the door of opportunity to reach these people by sitting with them, talking with them, to study with them, to encourage them, to win their souls to Christ. So now, once we have prayed, that door of opportunity will be open. God's word promises that. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. So now, as we go and we sit with this person that we have been praying for days and weeks and months, once we sit with them, it's time now to diagnose their spiritual condition. To what, friends? Put it there. Put this on your note paper. This is what Safe to Serve Local have been going through every day. We are in our training school session. Number one, we must diagnose the person's spiritual condition. If we do not know where they are, we can never help them. And if we don't know where they are, we may think that we are helping them when indeed we are what? We are hurting them. Is that clear? Now normally, the question is asked, then pastor, how then may I diagnose the person I'm trying to lead to Christ? 
Listen, we diagnose them by asking questions. So once we sit with them, after we have prayed, amen, then we began to ask, we must begin to ask questions. And once we ask questions, we should begin to listen. We have two ears. Listen, friends. Ask God to give us a listening ear. Listen to them. Yes. And by asking questions and listening to them, we'll be able to diagnose their condition. And once we can diagnose them, then God will give us the answer from his word and God will give us the specific life experiences that we have gone through in order to strengthen them. We must diagnose them. And normally speaking, there are three categories. How many? There are three categories that these people are in. I will cover them shortly. Look with me at Luke chapter 2. Luke what chapter? Luke chapter 2. And the point that you must understand that even at the age of 12, that Jesus Christ was able to diagnose people's spiritual condition in order to help them. This is why I even have teens in my class. If they are consecrated, if they are dedicated, they can be soul winners for Christ. Luke chapter 2 and verse number 40, it says, about Christ and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him he waxed strong in the spirit filled with wisdom and God's grace was upon him he that winneth souls is wise verse number 42 it says he was 12 years of age at this time and verse number 46 says, it says, and it came to pass that after three days, Mary, Joseph, found him in the temple. What was he doing there? It says, uh, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them. What, friends? Hearing them and asking them Questions, did Christ at the age of 12 uh, diagnose these spiritual, these so-called spiritual leaders in the church and the people? Friends, gospel work is true medical missionary work. We become true spiritual physicians, would you say amen? As he asks questions, as he listens to them, verse number 47 says, and all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and what? And his answers. So now there are three categories generally that people fall into. Three categories. One of these three. They may manifest symptoms in these three categories. But we are looking and listening for the, sim the predominant symptoms. And then we can quickly place them in one of these three categories and then we can begin to have Christ minister to them through us. In this study, I will only address the first category and that first category is found in the book Steps to Christ, God's Love for Man. In this group, as you sit with people, they will say words such as when you ask them, so how was your day? How are things going on with you presently? And they begin to use words such as, uh, life is hard. <laughs> I just don't know how I'm going to make it. Things are falling apart in the marriage. Things are falling apart in the home. Things such as, I lost my job. I was laid off. I'm sick. I feel like giving up. They will even say, I am just doubting God right now. I do not know if God is hearing my prayers. Some will even say, I even feel suicidal. This is a class of people who doubt God. They lack faith. They are doubtful. They feel like giving up. At that very point, they belong in category number one. And friends, let me tell you, 
the Bible tells us in the last days uh, that many are going to be plagued with the cares of life. The majority of the people you meet are going to be in this category, category number one, lacking faith in Christ, feel like giving up. They are burdened with uh, the trials of life, the cares of life. So now, once we diagnose them by asking questions, listening to them, then what do we do next, friends? Firstly, we must acknowledge their emotions. Say words such as, it is understandable the way how you feel. And if they feel down, go down there with them. And then I will show you now how to bring them up. Romans 12 says, Verse 12 onward, that we must rejoice with those that rejoice and we must weep with them that weep, praise God. Go down there with them. Christ had to go down to lift people up. Go down there with them. Acknowledge how they feel. Don't say that you know what they're feeling because you do not know. It's understandable the way how you feel based on what you are going through. And the second step now is uh, begin to share your experiences. At that point, God will now give you the opportunity to select one of your life's experiences. Share with them how in the past you have been distrustful of God. You have felt as if God was not hearing your prayers. Share with them how there have been times in which uh, you did not know if you were going to make it the next moment. Share with them how in the past you have been burdened by the cares of life. And the Holy Spirit at that time will tell you how much details to give. Amen, friends? And as you begin to share, because with all of us, uh, have at some point in life lacked faith in Christ, felt like giving up some of us to a greater degree than others. Hear me now. The mere fact that you are there, it is because you have something that Christ wants you to use to help them. And as you begin to share how in the past you have doubted God, don't stop there. Now what did you do? Share with them now how you even felt like not praying. You even felt as if you did not want to read God's word, but something led to you picking up the word of promise. God's word. And as you began to read this text and that text, that your faith began to grow stronger. It was this text and that scripture and turn there and read those scriptures in a persuasive manner and hear how you left from the pit of despondency and how Christ placed you, your feet on that solid rock of promise. And then you may have to, you may have to go through this two times, three times. Why? Some people will take it firstly. The first round, they accept it. Others, because they are so deep in the pit of despondency, so deep in the pit of doubt and not trusting God, I don't believe that God exists, etc., etc., you will have to, as they rebut what you're saying, don't say, no, you must believe it. No, 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 no. You pause. Listen again to what they say. And then Put yourself in their place and let them know, yes, I was once in that place too. It was very difficult to accept it. I just could not believe it. I even said, is God really real? Put yourself back in their position. If they rebut you a second time, even if they come a third time, put yourself back in their position again. Then come forth. And show them another scripture that encourage you. And another scripture that encourage you. And persuade them to believe the scriptures. Tell them even today as I'm reading 
these scriptures to you right now. My faith is growing stronger. Tell them you believe the word again and that they must believe it right now. Persuade them to believe it. That's it, friends. So now, what scriptures can you use? Because all of us have been in this category number one. Even some of you right now are in this category number one. So let me give you some text that Safe to Serve Local have been going through these past few weeks in our training school. What text could you remember and use now to encourage somebody who is in category number one? Write these texts down. Job chapter 38 and verse number 11. Go there with me. Job 38. Job 38 and verse number 11. The Bible tells us in Job 38 and verse number 11. And when you read a scripture, tell them. Don't say you must believe it first. Tell them as I read this scripture. This scripture spoke to me in this way. All right. Point to yourself first. And since this scripture helped me this way, I had to believe it. I believed it today. You must believe it. Persuade them to believe it. Job 38, God says, even though we go through trials and crises, the ways of discouragement, the ways of strife and problems, as God says to the waves, the waters of the sea, this far and no further, God can do it for me. And God did it for me. And since God did it for me, I believe he would do it for you. As I had to have patience and just wait, you must just wait on the Lord. Amen. And the scriptures now is brought to life. Why? They see a living witness of this word. Then you can write down Psalm 76. And verse number 10 is a companion scripture. It says, it says in Psalm 76 and verse number 10, the wrath of men shall praise thee, but the remainder of wrath God will restrain. In other words, if God allows a problem to come to me, it is because there's something in that problem for me to give him praise and thanks for. For Psalm 76, verse number 10 says, If there was nothing in this problem that, from, that I can give God thanks for, God would restrain it. Again, you can say Mary Smith. Again, John Brown. I have read this scripture in your hearing. I believe it again. It is still helping me. Since God is strengthening me to believe it, he is strengthening you to believe it. Please believe God's word today. Amen. You can also write down. Let's go to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. You can also write down. You can also write down. Psalm, uh, Romans chapter 8 is one more text. Uh, Romans chapter 8 uh, and verse 28 onward. It says, for all things work it together for what? Good. Yes, uh, to them that love God uh, are the call to his all things work it together for good. There's something good in that problem. As I read it, I was encouraged. And God is no respecter of persons. Uh, Please, John Brown, believe God's word today. And if John Brown throws an excuse, don't say, okay, here's one more text, John Brown. Believe it? No, 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 no. Put yourself again, listen carefully, put yourself again in his position. Rephrase the excuse and bring forth an experience. I once had that excuse, but this scripture... One more scripture, friends. Oh, friends, Christ says, if I, and if I be lifted up, I will draw John Brown. I will draw them unto myself. Lift up Jesus. But through your experience, Psalm 139, you can give them verse 17 and verse 18, which clearly say these two verses, 
that even though we are going through problems, when I read this, it says, if I count my blessings, I will see that they are numerous. And when I began to go through my crises, similar to what you were going through, John Brown, I'm not going through exactly what you were going through, but I have gone through similar things. And do you know what will awaken John Brown and lift him from that pit of despondency and place his feet on the sure rock of God's promises, the sure rock of Christ's word? If your life experience was lower, was worse than his, because many times people become discouraged Despondent because they believe that their case is the worst one in the world. But when they meet someone who has had a worse off experience and how they were lifted up through Christ's word, they will also be encouraged. Are you seeing it, my friends? That's Psalm 139, verse 17 and verse 18. And if John Brown comes back and say, but I can't see God, how do I know that he believes? How do I know he lives? How do I know he's hearing my prayers? Don't say, okay, John Brown, here's one more text. No, 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 say it to serve. That's not how we do it. We say, okay, John Brown, I'm hearing you. Acknowledge his feelings again. It's understandable you feel that way. I once felt that way. And again, the Holy Ghost will share with you how deep you can go in that detailed testimony. And if you don't have something similar to that, you can simply say, a close friend of mine have gone through something similar and this scripture is what helped him. Yes, friends. Yes, you can turn now and show him John 20, verse 29, that when Thomas said, Lord, except I touch you, except I put my hand in your wounds, I won't believe, I won't believe. But John 20, verse 29, Christ said to Thomas, Thomas, because you touched me physically, you believe? Okay, Thomas, blessed are they who believe even though they have not yet seen. Thomas, you believe because you have seen and touched, but blessed are those who believe in me, even though they have not seen me, literally. Tell John Brown, when I read that scripture, it encourages me, all right? I must believe God, but John Brown believe, and notice now, because it is not by your might, it's not by your power. It's not by just your testimony. It's not by just this uh, giving of the word, but by God's Holy Spirit, hear me? Because you have been praying and fasting with Christ uh, for John Brown, there is going to be a breakthrough. And as you persuade, as I persuade John Brown, I must also ask John Brown, John Brown, will you believe me? As I began to read this scripture and that scripture, I, I realized that very moment I had to surrender doubt. God called me to yield. He called me to surrender. And the surrender here is, is on the point of doubt, lack of faith. I must believe, Sir John Brown, will you surrender and yield? Persuade him. And a breakthrough will come, friends. But notice now, I will have to leave John Brown at some point. So I can't leave John Brown there. He may have left the pit of despondency. But I have to strengthen John Brown's will so that, by God's grace, John Brown would not go back into the cave of fear, the cave of despondency, the cave of sui suicidal thoughts the cave of depression so now i must strengthen him i must strengthen his will so what text can i give him it must be a text that has strengthened me so now i will turn john brown to matthew chapter 11 john brown this scripture i use daily to strengthen my faith because it's a daily experience and i read for him matthew chapter 11 
verse 28 through verse 30. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. I will turn to now Philippians chapter 2, John Brown. This scripture strengthens my will, encourages me daily. That it is Christ who works in me both to will and to do of his good pleasure. I may pause there and explain what it means. It is God who will work in me both to will. He will give me a strong will to do of his good pleasure. Not to doubt him. Not to say I'm a professed atheist. Not to doubt but to believe, John Brown. And since this scripture strengthens me daily, I believe it will strengthen you. John Brown, believe. Yes, you may have to pause and pray, Father in heaven. Take these testimonies. Take these, your words. You say in Isaiah 55, your words will not return unto you, for dear God, strengthen us. Strengthen John Brown in Christ's name. Amen. I may turn now to Philippians chapter, chapter 4. And verse 19, John Brown, when everything seems dark, this scripture strengthens me. The Bible says, my God will provide all my needs according to his riches in glory. John Brown, this strengthens me. I may turn to, to the experience of Genesis 32 and say, John Brown, many times I see myself as Jacob. Wrestling with God, not against God, saying, Dear God, I will not let you go until you bless me, until you increase my faith. I won't let you go. And John Brown, this experience is encouraging me continually. John Brown, it will do the same for you. John Brown, today, believe God's word, it will be food and sustenance to your soul. But what if at this point something happens and John Brown says, okay, but how do I know I have faith? Some people are so far in the pit. Don't say, John Brown, here's one more text. No, 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 say it to serve. We don't do it that way. We say, John Brown, I was once there too. And when I went back now to Romans chapter 12 and verse number 3, the Bible says God has given to every man the measure of faith. I may run to the kitchen and have a glass of water. John Brown, this is a measure of water in the glass. God has given to me the measure of faith. Faith to fight the fiery darts of the wicked. Faith to shield the shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. And this measure of faith. So whatever the crises are, I already have from Christ Jesus the measure of faith. So whatever I need to go through this crisis, God has already given it to me. And John Brown, when I read that scripture, I said, why am I discouraged? I sang Psalm 42. Why art thou cast down? O oh, my soul, why art thou disquieted? Hope thou in God. Why? I already have the measure of faith. When I'm thirsty, John Brown, I know the measure of water I need. Amen. And I drink the measure to quench my thirst. So when I go through crises, the Bible says, Romans 12, verse 3, God has already given to me the measure of faith. John Brown, I believe it again. Stop doubting, believe. And friends, a breakthrough will come. Listen, if somebody was sick to the point of death, how long? Would a literal doctor, surgeon, physician, and nurses keep working on that soul until life is restored? So as spiritual physicians, as missionaries, we may have to sit with that soul maybe all night and keep working, keep using the formula and not deviating. 
praying and God will give us that soul. Yes, my friends, I believe it. We have to strengthen that will. But here says somebody, but pastor, what if I don't have any experience to share? Look with me. That means you are a novice. And novices cannot be soul winners. Look with me. 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. Chapter 3. 1 Timothy. Chapter 3. Verse 5 and verse number 6 says, A novice cannot be a soul winner. And who is a novice? A novice is a person who doesn't have an experience. And friends, God has given to all of us an experience. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Go there with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to whom? Common to man. But God is faithful. So whatever these people are going through, these things are common to man. We might not be going through the very specific crisis, but the crises are common to man. Look with me. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. And something enlightened my understanding recently. When I look at certain scriptures, especially the scriptures in the Bible to encourage those who are in category number one. Generally, those scriptures show that Jesus Christ has gone through similar experiences. Look with me. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest, that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. So was he touched with the feelings of our infirmities? The answer is yes, yet without sin. Yes, my friends. Verse number 16, now he says, Come boldly to the throne of grace, praise God. You may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Do you see it, friends? Hebrews chapter 2. Listen what this says here, friends. It says, look here. This is volume 6, page 133. It says, novices cannot acceptably do the work of unfolding the hidden treasure to enrich souls in spiritual things. It says in Ministry of Healing, page 494, it says, watch carefully, help those, listen, help those who have erred by what? By telling them of your experiences. Listen here, Hebrews chapter 2. Verse number 17, it says, uh, we'll skip on down to verse 18. Verse 18 says, uh, for in that he himself uh, has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Listen here, friends. Inspiration says uh, all of us must have a diary. Bible commentary, volume 2. Page, uh, page 1012, it says, There are thousands of souls willing to work for the Master who have not had the privilege of hearing the truth as some have heard it, but they have been faithful readers of the Word of God, and they will be blessed in their humble efforts to impart light to others. Let such ones keep a diary. Again, let such ones keep a diary. And when the Lord gives them an, in, in, an interesting experience, let them write it down as Samuel did when the armies of Israel won a victory over the Philistines. He set up a monument of thankfulness saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. 1 Samuel 7 verse 12, brethren, where are the monuments by which you keep in view the love and goodness of God? Huh? Strive to keep fresh in your minds the help that the Lord 
has given you in your efforts to help others. Let not your action show one trace of selfishness. Every tear that the Lord has helped you wipe from sorrowful eyes. Every fear that has been expelled. Every mercy shown. Trace a record of it in your diary. Why? As thy days, so shall thy strength be. Deuteronomy 33, verse 25. John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, we see a, a work from John the Baptist. And God has called all of us to do the work of John the Baptist in some measure. To some degree. And John chapter 1 verse 29 says. Uh, the next day John sees Jesus coming unto him. And saith behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. So to whom did John the Baptist point the people to? To the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And as John pointed the people. To Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, to take away sin, to take away doubt, to take away depression, to take away the thoughts to just give up. Did the people look and live? The majority looked and live. We must point to Jesus as we diagnose the people and find them in category number one. Skip on down with me to verse number 32. Look how John gave his testimony. It says, and John be a record saying, I saw the Spirit of God descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon Jesus, and I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. Pause right there. So did John the Baptist have an experience with Christ? Yes, my friends. John heard something. The one upon whom you see the Spirit like a dove descending upon and remaining upon, that is the Messiah. That is the Lamb of God. Did John have an experience? The answer is yes. So now the following day, when John saw Christ coming and the people were around, what did John say again? Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And John could speak so persuasively because John the Baptist had an experience, such an experience that John's two disciples, when they heard this, the Bible says they followed Jesus Christ. Look with me. Verse number 34. I saw and be a record. That this is the Son of God. Did John have a testimony? Yes. Verse 35. Again the next day. After John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak. And they followed Jesus. Praise God. The way how John the Baptist spoke, the disciples followed Christ. It's startling. The two closest disciples of John were convicted by John's testimony. If we have an experience with Christ, when we give our testimony, when we open God's word, others will follow Christ. Praise God, friends. Look with me now. As they began to follow Christ, the question was that John and Andrew asked Jesus, Where dwellest thou? In other words, friends, when Andrew and John heard John the Baptist speak so persuasively and convictingly of Jesus Christ being the Messiah, they wanted an experience with Christ for themselves. Master, we are dwellest thou, praise God. So now, when we have such a personal, abiding, 
connection with Jesus Christ. When we speak, it's going to be contagious in a spiritual sense. Others, when they hear us, will want that same experience with Christ. Look with me. Verse number 38. Then Christ turned and saw them following and saith unto them, What seek you? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? They wanted to abide with Christ. Oh, friends, this is what the world needs. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then shall the end come. People, when they hear us, our convincing and persuasive experience, they will want to abide with Christ. Notice now, notice now, Andrew and John asked Jesus, they called Jesus, they called him Rabbi. Rabbi means what? Master. Rabbi means what? Teacher. They were now in a condition to hail Jesus as their master. They were willing now for Jesus to teach them. They wanted to learn of Christ. It began with a persuasive testimony, a rich experience from John the Baptist. And the Bible says in verse 39 that they dwelt with Jesus the whole night. This is whom? Andrew and John. They dwelt with Christ that whole night. Was Christ teaching them that night? Yes. So when we give the gospel a rich experience, we may have to show people that many times we spend time in all night prayer meetings. And when they have all night prayer meetings, the next morning they will be so filled with the rich experience of Christ that like like, like Andrew, who calls Simon, they will go and call another person to come to Christ. They will give their experience. Verse number 40, it says, One of the two which heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother. Andrew finds his own brother Simon. And saith unto him, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. But now notice, Andrew said, we have found him. I have found him. Not only that John the Baptist spoke persuasively, but Simon, I followed him. Oh, friends. Simon, I dwelt with him. I abode with him. I spent time with him last night, Simon. Come, come, Simon. Come and have such a similar experience. Praise God. Listen now. When Simon came in verse 42, when he came to Christ, what happened, friends? You know, friends, it's a beautiful thing that Andrew began in his own household. He called his own brother named Simon. So where must we begin? Begin reaching the people who are at the closest to us. And verse 42 says, when Simon came and met Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus changed Simon's name to Peter. In other words, when Andrew called Simon, because Andrew had such a persuasive testimony, a rich experience with Christ, Peter, Simon, could not evade the call Simon had to follow. And when Simon came to Christ, it is evident that Simon's true experience with Christ began. Why? Because Simon's name was changed. His character began to be changed. Oh, my friends, can you see it? Bible says now in verse 43 that Christ met Philip. And Philip had an experience, a rich experience with Christ. Verse 43, the day following, Christ would go forth into Galilee. Into where? Galilee. And finds Philip. And saith unto him, Follow me. 
Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. So now Andrew and Peter, even John, they were having such a rich experience. And now Philip in the same city was having a similar experience. And the Bible says that Philip did not and could not keep that rich experience to himself. The Bible says Philip went and he called Nathaniel. When Philip called Nathaniel, how did Philip call Nathaniel to Christ? Philip simply told Nathaniel, oh listen, that he had found the Messiah. He had met Christ for himself. Philip gave Nathaniel his experience based on scripture. And the Bible tells us that Nathaniel was doubtful. Praise God. So Nathaniel represents people in category number one. What said Nathaniel to Philip? Can any good thing come out from Nazareth of Galilee? He doubted. And how did, how did Philip respond to Nathaniel? He said, now just come and see. Praise God. Come and see, come and see what has made me believe. Oh, friends, do you see it? Come and see what has made me believe. This is the Messiah. And friends, because Philip's testimony was so persuasive based on scripture, Nathaniel came to meet Christ. Look with me. It says in verse 45, Philip finds Nathaniel. And saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Son of whom? Joseph. Don't forget that. And Nathanael said unto him, can, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Yes, I have found him in scripture. Come and see, Nathaniel, you must believe. Ah, oh, friends. So this scripture is just a confirmation of what we covered a few moments ago. Did Nathaniel go to meet him? Yes, my friends. And listen now, what was Nathaniel's testimony once he met Christ? Philip called Christ the son of Joseph, meaning his, his uh, revelation of Christ was not complete, but he shared what he knew. Is that clear? But when Nathaniel came to meet Christ, how did Nathaniel style and call Christ the son of God? Oh, friends, the very soul we call to meet Christ may have a deeper experience than ourselves. But don't let that worry you. Yes, and you don't have to wait until you know everything. Like Philip, once you have met Christ, go. It says, friends, it says in verse number 49. Nathanael answered and saith unto Jesus, Rabbi, thou art the son of God. Thou art the king of Israel, the son of God. And Nathanael called Christ Rabbi. In other words, he was having the same, a similar experience as Andrew and John the Beloved, who called Christ Rabbi, Nathaniel, was willing now for Jesus to be his teacher. Ah, oh, friends, do you see it, friends? And notice now, in closing, what did Christ say to Nathaniel? Verse 51, Verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. I wish I could pause right there. But the point you must get here, there is, no, there is no other scripture 
that mentions the account of Nathaniel. It seems to me, once Nathaniel had this experience, he went on to be sealed, to be settled in the truth. Praise God. This is the experience that people need. Christ now turned Nathaniel's attention to himself and to heaven. And the help, the assistance that is available to him. Praise God. So what is God saying to us? Whenever we find ourselves in category number one, we feel as if we have been cut off from heaven. Christ is not hearing our prayers. We feel lonely and destitute. I go back to John chapter 1, verse 51. Christ is saying, if I look with the eye of faith, I will see heaven open. Praise God. I will see angels ascending first and descending upon the Son of Man because of Christ, who is the ladder. So because of Christ, angels ascend on my behalf. Praise God, friends. So my prayers, the angels take up there. Amen. And the blessings from heaven come down. But all these things are a reality because of Jesus Christ. I'm not cut off. If I just come and say, Rabbi, teach me. Now I read Matthew chapter 11, verse number 28. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, Rabbi. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I read that, I'm encouraged. Now I ask the question, Save to Serve International. Believe God's word. Will you believe it? You need to believe it. Strength is yours. It's time now to go forward. 2016, the year for aggressive evangelism. The work of Elijah, the work of John the Baptist. Father in heaven,